very British scandal. A billionaire knighted by the Queen and richer than Donald Trump has allegedly been sexually harassing some of his staff for years. Here in the Nexus, we're going to be looking at the allegations and how he was able to stop the newspaper that broke the story from revealing his name. We'll also be asking why it took a lord to expose a knight. Confused? Well, let's try to clear it up here in the Nexus. Hello, I'm Matthew Moore, and today in the Nexus we have Sir Philip Green, a British retail billionaire worth around $5 billion, with friends and acquaintances in high places. You name it, he probably knows them. Beyonce, Kate Moss, Tony Blair, David Cameron. He's clearly a powerful man. But right now he's being accused of sexually and racially harassing his staff. And that is barely half of it. How the allegations came out is another story. A court injunction prevented the Daily Telegraph identifying the leading businessman facing unsavoury allegations. A leading businessman has been granted an injunction to prevent this newspaper from revealing alleged sexual harassment and racial abuse. They published allegations without giving his name, calling it the Me Too scandal which cannot be revealed. I feel it's my duty under parliamentary privilege to name Philip Green as the individual in question. You need to leave. Go away. Lord Hayne has used parliamentary privilege to name retail billionaire Sir Philip Green. Sir Philip Green. Sir Philip Green. Billionaire businessman Sir Philip Green, who's been accused of sexual harassment by five women. He's known as the king of the high street. Sir Philip Green owns Topshop and Miss Selfridge, and he's accused of paying staff members to keep quiet about inappropriate behaviour. Rich people have that available to them is that they can pay people to go away. Go away. Green is now on all of the front pages alongside the original man of Me Too fame. This is, of course, Harvey Weinstein. The billionaire said he categorically and wholly denies the claims. To the extent that it is suggested that I have been guilty of unlawful sexual or racist behavior, I categorically and wholly deny these allegations. The businessman told the Mail on Sunday there had only been some banter which had never been offensive. It's not the first time Sir Philip's reputation has taken a battering. The multi-billionaire now battling to save his reputation and knighthood following the collapse in April of BHS. Leaving a half a billion pound hole in its pension fund. Ordinary decent working people uh, have been dealt uh, a heavy blow. Of course MPs to brand him the unacceptable face of capitalism. There are now renewed calls for his knighthood to be taken away. Will you respond to those who made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? Oh, well, so many things to discuss, and we have exactly the right cast for you. Andre Walker is a print journalist. He knows what it takes to get that kind of a story and to stand it up. We also have uh, the uh, women's rights activist and lawyer, uh, Shola Mashogmabimu. Uh, she is joining us here in London as well. And the media lawyer, uh, Mark Lewis. Now, Mark, from the Telegraph's scoop, as they like to call it, and they call it the Me Too movement, all we know is that there are allegations of sexual misconduct, uh, some bullying and also uh, racist behaviour. But that's it. I mean, what does sexual misconduct mean? Well, well, at the moment, we don't know very much about the case itself, other than the fact that it has been said in the House of Lords that Sir Philip Green is the claimant who tried to stop a story coming out, and to some extent has stopped a story coming out, but it causes problems for Sir Philip Green that he's been named, and it also causes problems for two of the potential alleged victims who also say they didn't want the story to come out. You see, the Telegraph is suggesting this is the big British Me Too story. Then we have another newspaper with Philip Green and also Harvey Weinstein. We know all about uh, the allegations against him. They're extremely serious. But as far as the allegations made in the Telegraph are concerned, sexual misconduct is what we're told, or sexual harassment. Now, that is a broad term, right? So what, what is the definition of sexual harassment as far as British law goes? Well, I think we have a very different situation between what is being said in, in America uh, as the Me Too movement and what the allegations are, because we don't really know what is being said against Sir Philip Green. We do know it's being said that he's done 
certain things that are, are at the very least inappropriate. Whether they are against the criminal law, we don't know, and nobody suggested that there is a criminal allegation. There's no prosecution pending. Civil law, probably, if there's an employer relationship or something, he's breaking that relationship, he certainly could be sued and that's why he's settled. Uh, Shola, if I can come to you for a moment, as far as Sir Philip Green goes, he has issued a very strong statement saying as far as unlawful sexual and racist behaviour goes, he completely denies it. Another newspaper though, which has not been injuncted, The Guardian, has given some details of allegations made by a so-called insider. OK, so we know that this insider, quoted by The Guardian, says, you know, he had been asking women in meetings if they'd been naughty girls, creeping up behind women to make them jump before caressing their shoulders to reassure them, calling women sweetheart, darling, rather by their names. How is this sort of behaviour, these are allegations, defined in the law? Right. Now, I think we need to be very careful here. Uh, and I find his use of um, his term sustain unlawful, denying any unlawful, like very interesting because it's a play on words. So let's, let's look at this very, uh, very carefully. First of all, the use the force, any misogynistic behavior towards a woman that makes her feel uncomfortable, that makes her feel consistently harassed from a man would be unacceptable. And mm. that is what it sounds to me like these, um, these people are saying. They're saying, look, the, the, the constant use of um, terms of endearment that were inappropriate, the, the, the constant use of terms or even touching that we're not consented to is unacceptable. That's what they say. Now, under the law, if it's going to be a criminal act, just like Mark um, explained, it can't be covered up. It can't be covered up by any contractual agreement like an NDA. The question is then, uh, this, these sort of allegations, were they true, uh, would be not covered under criminal law? Wouldn't it be just simply an HR issue? There's nothing, uh, there's no such thing as an HR issue, okay? So it, it, it can be covered under the law if the, if the victims themselves are able to present a case to show how it was a constant um, harassment of their person and that they were possibly even in fear of losing their jobs because they could not rebuff him, they could not reject his advances. I think a whole lot more needs to be understood in terms of the totality of the circumstances. Of course, we expect uh, Philip Green to deny it. But what we've not heard are the facts of the case from the victims themselves. But I have to also point out that we must respect the privacy of the victims if they do not want to be thrown into the public circus of the court of public opinion. Well, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, let me ask you something, Andre. Um, in, in terms of uh, Philip, Sir Philip's uh, responses to various other papers now, including the Daily Mail and so on, he has called certain behaviour that he is engaged in over the years, merely banter. In other words, a little bit of back and forth with the employees. Uh, do you think this is uh, a generational thing, perhaps? Well, I think uh, everybody agrees that Philip, Sir Philip Green's a fairly detestable individual. He's certainly not somebody that I'd like to invite out to the pub. But what I would say is that we get a bit confused here with the word sexual. And I think when you talk about sexual misconduct, there is something that is sexual harassment, which is making off-colour remarks, and then the sexual assault, which is what Harvey Weinstein is accused of. And I think we need to be really, really clear that just because both of these things include the word sexual doesn't make them related in, in any way. And one of the things that sort of amazes me about this whole thing is that um, if you were to make an off-colour remark to me and we work together, then what would I do? I'd take you to an industrial tribunal mm. and, uh, and you would have to potentially pay me compensation. Or you might agree to pay me compensation without going to the tribunal and we'd have a non-disclosure agreement. Now, of course, one of the big differences is that the non-disclosure agreement very often comes with a bigger settlement because it's easier for everybody involved. So it strikes me that these people, after accusing Sir Philip Green, were either going to get a financial settlement or they were going to get a financial settlement. Uh, Mark? All I was saying is it's not an either or that they would get a financial settlement or a financial settlement. If cases would have gone to a tribunal, it is also possible that on the evidence that somebody might lose a case. And nobody has tested that. The purpose of an NDA agreement is to enable an employer or a person in Sir Philip Green's position to say, I don't admit liability, but I'm going to pay you 
but I don't want it to be inferred by the fact that I've made a payment for a nuisance value or, or for a settlement value because these things aren't clear, that it's then inferred that my payment to you means that I have done it. And that is what has not been, not been tried. And, and it's very difficult because, yes, Sir Philip Green is a detestable individual as you would describe him, and therefore we tend to dislike people who are pantomime villains, that we must say, well, it's for Sir Philip Green. If it would be someone that we quite liked, we might want to take a different view. Uh, Mark, if, if uh, you have the employee and Sir Philip entering into an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, what does that mean if the Telegraph is approaching people who have entered into these agreements and getting information, what, what does that mean about the information that they have? Well, well, I suspect it's not the Telegraph approaching someone. The Telegraph would have got a tip-off from somebody who's effectively involved, whether they're actually subject to the NDA agreement or know of the NDA agreement, and say they've taken the view that there is some public interest in this that they ought to tell a newspaper. Now, the difficulty is, is that where do you draw the balance? It's useful because it encourages a settlement, but at the same time, it's covering up something potentially that ought to be out there mm. and can stop other people being future victims. Uh, Shola, that's uh, a point yeah. you, you want to make very strongly, isn't it? That the NDAs have the potential to cover mm -hmm. up things that should be known by the next employee who comes along. Absolutely. I think it's important that we do bear public interest in mind here. We bear in mind the welfare of um, uh, potential employees that go into the organization. But at the same time, with my lawyer hat on, I have to say we also have to respect the rights of both parties to enter into a settlement arrangement. So if the victim chooses to enter into a settlement mm. arrangement and um, wishes to have this, the issue, the dispute addressed that way, then from the perspective of the law, it works for them. To be clear, though, uh, an NDA but does Ma not Matthew, prevent Matthew, the alleged victim the difficulty. from reporting a crime or even an infraction of the regulations. That's right. Absolutely, that's right. And it would be absolutely illegal for any contract to mm. prevent the disclosure of a crime. So no contract can do that. But what the contract mm. would say, what the NDA would say, any lawyer worth their salt would ensure that it says that the NDA is not an admission of guilt. It's not just... The old-fashioned world of retail having its problems. A Google staff around the world are walking out in protest of the company's treatment of women. Their biggest concern is what's known as forced arbitration, which Google and other Silicon Valley employers often insist on. Uh, let me come to you, Shola. Uh, you're, you're an attorney in New York, uh, so you're, you're qualified to talk about this. Forced arbitration, is, is that the same as NDAs and are they worse? No, arbitration is just another form of dispute resolution. And the reason why it's been termed as forced is because employees pretty much sign into it in their employment contracts. That if there are any disputes, internal disputes, they have to go through this process. Now, the negative impact of that is that it removes any options for the employees outside the organization to seek recourse. And that is why it's been termed as, you know, for, forced arbitration. It means that they're probably in fear of losing their jobs mm. if they don't take that route. But it's not unique to Google. It's not, I mean, many institutions have these, these clauses and it's a way for them to manage disputes. It's a way for them to manage their reputational risk, which is why they do it this way. Okay, now let's focus on the injunction. How did Green's legal team convince the judges to grant an injunction and how did they find out the paper was even working on the story? Here's how The Telegraph explains it. The paper says it got its first tip-off about Green in February, and journalists quickly began asking around to find out if the allegations were true. Their inquiries got back to Green, and by April, the journalists were contacted by his PR execs, demanding to know more about the allegations. The paper kept silent. So Green's lawyers sent them letters, warning their news gathering techniques amounted to harassment and that they could be fined or even imprisoned. But the paper persisted and by July, feeling ready to publish, it contacted Green for his side of the story. Green's response was to seek an interim injunction in court in a case simply listed as ABC DEF GHI versus Telegraph Media Group. Green's identity was protected for now. 
the judge had to weigh up if, at a full hearing, the non-disclosure agreements would be found to be more or less important than the public's right to know. In August, the High Court made its ruling. The paper should be allowed to publish the story. The public interest took precedence. But Green wasn't finished. He challenged the ruling in the Court of Appeal and won. The court deciding that the previous ruling hadn't given due consideration to the important and legitimate role played by non-disclosure agreements in the consensual settlement of disputes. The next day, the Telegraph broke its story, but because of the injunction, it couldn't name the businessman, nor could it reveal details of the allegations. The court also directed the whole affair to be examined at a speedy trial. But it never made it to that final legal stage because Lord Hain defied the injunction and named Green in Parliament. I feel it's my duty under parliamentary privilege to name Philip Green as the individual in question. It was Hain's parliamentary privilege to do so, but still, some argue he should have let the courts finish their work. Whether it was in the public interest or not is something that the courts were going to look at when they had time and when they had the full evidence available. I would have thought that that's now impossible uh, and therefore he is substituting his view of the public interest for the court's view of the public interest. I'm not sure Sholo agrees with that. Uh, Sholo, did you broadly support Lord Haynes' intervention, him exposing uh, Philip Green in, in the Houses of Parliament, House of Lords? Now, I don't find his action to be unlawful in any way, form or manner. Yes, he exercises parliamentary privilege. Um, and, I, and I understand the debate as to whether or not this challenges the court's um, view on what is public interest and perhaps he's, he's pushed forward the debate before the time. But the question should be this. Was he subject to the injunction? No. What, did he have information available that he felt that using his own position of influence to share with the public, yes. Yeah, come in, Andre. He is a legislator. And what he is able to do, if he is unhappy with the defamation bill, if he is unhappy with libel laws, if he's unhappy with the rules on injunctions, he may propose a law to change it. But actually, he's decided not to do that because that's hard work. What he's decided to do is take the lazy option, which is to completely ignore the process, completely ignore uh, the courts, completely ignore the pleadings that are going on by some of the most senior judges in the country and decide to jump in with who's two feet first. But we don't have to wait for him to propose changes to legislation. We can do that. So the activist in me says, yes, it's right what, but to what, share. But what has he, but what's he achieved in terms of his position, yeah, in terms of his it's position as a member of the House of Lords? What has he achieved other than just jumping in with two feet first? It's also an opportunity in this country for, the, for us to then use this platform to change the law, to bring about reform of, you know, the use of NDAs, of the defamation He's not deal. proposing to do that. He doesn't it, have to. He can. He's not proposing point. to change the law. I don't, I don't need him to do that. My point there, is there is I no proposal that. by he Peter Hayne to change that. the law. It, it's not different. just what, what he's achieved by, by it, it's the damage he's caused by it because it's possible now that there won't be a trial, there won't be investigations, there won't be allegations, so we have neither the Court of Appeal. We've got to remember this was an interim injunction. It was in place for, for 8 to 12 weeks or so, Matthew, so that the court could see what the evidence, Matthew, could hear the evidence, and then say what was the position. Part of the reason that the injunction was in place is Sir Philip Green may well be completely innocent. We all know in this room that um, in, in this country, very often for celebrities, it's guilty until proven innocent. And in reality, Peter Hayne has put his interests and the interests of his own personal publicity okay, ahead of the right process. Now, and I just say, look, I don't like Philip Green. I don't, think, I don't think Philip Green's a particularly nice guy. But you know what? He may well be innocent. And that's the purpose of the judicial process. Okay, and I think that we need to Philip stand by Green, that process. Philip Green should not be given an advantage that the average man on the street would not have because anybody else would not be able to afford. I mean, what's quite hard about this is I'm a journalist and she's a lawyer and I'm arguing for the judicial process. She's arguing for gobbing off. 
There's a, there's a certain arrogance in the position. Sorry, there is a certain arrogance between somebody who's a member of the House of Lords saying, I haven't read the evidence, but the three people, the senior judges who have read the evidence, they were, they were decided that there ought to be an injunction, but I have taken it upon myself to say there shouldn't be an injunction. We should have let the, we should have let them happen and shown his argument that saying, well, yes, because he's a rich and powerful person and the other people who might be affected don't have access to justice so they can get an injunction is the wrong one. What we should be saying is that those people also should have access to justice so they can get an injunction if they are in a situation that needs mm. it. Okay, it's the I other way around. Can I please respond to that? The bottom line is this. Did Peter Haynes um, commit an unlawful act? No, he did not. The argument about um, Philip Green possibly being an innocent man, or, you know, until it's proven, that does not take away his right or the right of the prosecutors to go into the case deeper. Philip I find Green, this extraordinary that effectively we've got a lawyer on this TV show saying that just because somebody's rich, we should incinerate the process. We should not give them access to the justice to which they are legally entitled. I mean, this is just crazy coming from well, a lawyer. I'm, I'm it should be yeah, me I'm as a journalist that. saying that I'm we should be breaking the rules. I need to respond to that. I'm a lawyer and I'm an activist. I have not once said we should incinerate the legal justice. You have asked. Is it, was it right for Lord Haynes to, to share the name of Philip Green? And I've said it's not an unlawful act. I'm very fine with him sharing Philip Green's name. And I'm also pointing out we must have a balance. Uh, Mark, in our discussions before the show, you made a very interesting point, which is that uh, media organisations are some of the biggest users of NDAs on the planet. Well, well quite. If, uh, uh, look, media organisations are not just reporting on cases, but they are big businesses themselves. And they don't have a problem entering into NDAs or forcing NDAs upon people. Look, there's an in inequality in bargaining position between the individual who's affected and the large company that is against them. So I can understand the arguments, which is why I said an interim injunction should exist until there is a trial or until there was a trial. What we have is the hypocrisy of organizations saying, oh, no, no, freedom of the press, we must... We must talk about this. And they are the same organisations who say, look, we want you to sign an NDA because we don't want people to know what we have been doing. A quick journalism question for you, Andre. What is the point of an injunction these days when you have, of course, the, the loophole of parliamentary privilege, but also you have all the social media and global media all chiming in? It's not, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it can be incredibly difficult. I mean, if you even think back to... Um, the, the royal abdication and Wallace Simpson. Of course, every newspaper in the world was running that, uh, that the king was having an affair with a married woman or a divorced woman, and we weren't running it in the United Kingdom. But I do think that, look, I'm somebody that have, has read a large number of injunctions and even seen some of the super injunctions that we can't even mention the existence of. And, you know, there are things about, say, child abuse. There are things about, um, you know, very private... Uh, family matters that are kept from the public domain and I think it is right that they're kept away. I think obviously something like this Sir Philip Green case was always going to come to light anyway but it's right that the process takes place but I think that you've got to bear in mind that a lot of the things that we're not allowed to publish actually I think most people would agree would be inappropriate to publish anyway. Well let's round this this whole debate off with a look at uh... Philip Green's knighthood. Um, Philip Green became Sir Philip Green back in 2006 after he was awarded a Knight's Bachelor for services to retail. It's the same honour bestowed on the likes of Elton John, Michael Caine and David Attenborough. And it acknowledges his massive retail empire with brands like Topshop, Top Man, Miss Selfridge, Dorothy Perkins. And now, after a uh, pension scandal at one of his previous businesses, BHS, people started to call him the unacceptable face of capitalism and, and MPs voted in favour of stripping Green of his knighthood back then. But uh, the decision was non-binding. So that leaves us now to examine the new, renewed calls for Sir Philip to lose his knighthood. Shola, I think uh, i come to you as a, it, wearing your activist hat. How do you feel about it? I think if um, the review of the circumstances of the case shows that he did commit this sexual uh, misconduct and harassment, then he should definitely lose the knighthood. What do you think, Andre? It's, um, well, how, would, how would they even do it? If they, they, they voted for it before and it didn't happen, how would they do it? 
Yeah, the answer to that is there's an honours committee that takes it away. So Parliament doesn't actually vote on these things. It's just an indicative thing. I think the big problem is there are calls to remove all sorts of people from all sorts of positions, some living, some dead. I think a review of every honour we ever gave out it is a little bit ridiculous. I have to say, though, if he is convicted of a crime, then he would lose it uh, basically as a matter of course. So it would be virtually automatic under those circumstances. Uh, Mark Lewis, do you have an opinion on this? Well, I think the position is, is the same as was just said. Look, there, is, it, it, there was an argument that he should have lost his, peer, uh, lost his knighthood last time. This time there's nothing proved. But we're going to have a position where people are going to come forward on every single peer, every single knight and say, actually, there is a reason why that sh person mm -hmm. shouldn't have their honour award. There is a question as to whether or not the honours award should be more capable of being reviewed generally. That is something for Parliament to do. Thank you very much. You have the last word here on the Nexus. Uh, Shola, thank you. And Andre, as ever, uh, thank you for your contribution to the Nexus as well. That's all we have time thank for. You. If you want to see this episode or our previous episodes, do go to our YouTube channel. But in the meantime, that's it. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Oh,